Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for coming to this short session today. Um, I want to introduce you to the Family Learning Organization, uh, FLO, as we call ourselves, and I. Uh, we have an email, a Facebook, and a Twitter account, and this session, we hope, will um, be screened on Facebook and YouTube uh, within the next week. My name is Kate O'Hanlon, and I'm going to do a session uh, now, as part of the literacy program that I would that I would work with, and this one is about sharing challenging picture books with children and young people. And as far as I'm concerned, there are certain things that children should have experience of in their schooling lives. One would be having been introduced to great literature, good writers and poets and playwrights, and particularly Shakespeare. By the time they leave primary, they should know at least who he is and what he did with his time. And the other one is they should have been introduced to quality, challenging and controversial picture books. And I use them, have used them with kids, certainly my own when they were very small, and then all the way through primary and all the way key, through key stage three. And if you get a particularly good one, you can use it with even lower sixth and upper sixth. Depends what you want to do with them. So in our session today, we're going to look at what we mean by them, why use them, and some examples of the best, or of some of the best. There's so many of them. And I simply do not mean by this a book which has a text on the bottom and the picture illustrates it. That is not what I mean by a picture book. So I'm going to start off by just show some pictures from um, picture books, uh, well, I'm going to walk you up through the ages, for example. And this is a famous classic picture book, many of you will know it, called Rosie's Walk by Pat Hutchins. And it's only one sentence long, and it's excellent for preschool and early years children. And it's just Rosie the hen went for a walk, as it says there. The only problem is that the fox is going as well. And all the way through the story of one sentence long, she walks along completely unconcerned and the fox is almost going to get her every time. And I use this for fun, for a laugh with them. It's, it, the real, kids really love it. And also for prediction and for inference. Because the children, I say, oh, the, 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 the fox is going to get her now. You'll get her now. And the children shout, no, he won't. No, he won't. And I say, how do you know that? And they say, well, because look, there's a great big rake and he's going to jump on it and knock him out and he won't get rosy. And it is hilarious. So they are already with a simple little picture book like Rosie's Walk. Here it is here, classic mm -hmm. book. They are being introduced to how to infer and, of course, how to predict. The pictures here complement the text. They do not illustrate the text. There is never a word mentioned of the fox. The word never comes up. Okay. And then this is not my Bernard. Now, not now Bernard is up the school a bit, maybe P3, up to P5, P7. And we've had some secondary people have used it. Not now Bernard. Maybe, again, many of you know David McKee's not now Bernard. And this is about Bernard who goes to his mum and says, hello, mum, not now Bernard. Oh, hello, dad, not now Bernard, said his dad. Oh, okay. So then he tells them that there's a monster in the garden that's going to eat him. Not now, Bernard, said his mum. So Bernard went out into the garden and lo and behold, hello, monster, he said to the monster. Right. The monsterette Bernard up every bit. And in the hmm. remainder of the story, the monster gathers himself and heads up into the house and takes over Bernard's role in the house. Now it takes primary three several goals of Bernard in order to work out what happened to Bernard. So when I say, what happened to Bernard? They'll say, oh, the monster ate him. And I say, really? The monster ate him. So I remember one day with P3 saying, is there actually such a thing as a monster? Miss Wee Girl, South Armagh School said, hmm, there's a monster in my garden, but my mommy won't believe me. So <laughs> I had a bit of a problem there in dealing with that. But eventually what they realize is that Bernard becomes a monster because his mommy and daddy ignore him and won't answer him every time he says, hello, mom, hello, dad. They just ignore him and he becomes a monster. And at the end of 
sometimes, but on using it philosophically with children as young as primary three. Um, when we, I said to the class, what do you think we can do to get Bernard back? How can we get the good Bernard back? And this wee boy said, if his mommy gave him a big hug. And I think that was the right answer. I love that one. That is deeply philosophical and very, you know, so much you could do with the book. I don't mean that every time you have a book, you want to do something with it. You may just be enjoying it. But if you do want to do something with Not My Bernard, you can use that on parenting programs, you know, talking to children about what it's like in a family to love one another. And this one, now this one is taken from a fantastic book called The Night Shimmy. Here it is here. And The Night Shimmy is by, of course, Anthony Brown, who's one of the classic, classic writers of children's books. And this is by the wee boy who is lonely. He seems to have no siblings. And he, um, because he's so lonely, he becomes the night shimmy. And when you see in the picture there down at the bottom, you see the costume. He puts on this fabulous, fantastic costume. He's now the night shimmy. And when he's the night shimmy, he can do whatever he likes. He won't go to bed and he won't eat his peas and he won't do his homework. He's the night shimmy, you see, and do whatever he likes. And it's, it's the child sort of escaping into another world because in his own world, he's nobody to talk to. He meets this wee girl one day and the two of them become friends. And in the middle of the book, there's this massive illustration of what you see there with nothing written underneath it. And the amount of talking, of, of, of verbalizing, of thinking, of questioning that you can do uh, with that one illustration from the night shimmy is unbelievable because there they are in the distance, the wonderful light shadows behind them and all these parrots. And then of course the, the monkey was always a feature in Anthony Brown and he has discarded his night shimmy costume. And in fact, because he gets a friend, he does lose the night shimmy. But what we wonder is what are they saying to each other? We wonder under the tree, what are they talking about under the tree? The two friends. And that's a book about, um, about loneliness and about friendship. A, a wonderful, wonderful book, um, The Night Shimmy. Now, if you go further on up, and I'd say any of you who have a knowledge of drama will know The Arrival by Sean Tan. And this is definitely secondary. This is a sepia colored uh, picture book, quite long, as you can see. It's quite a large, you know, there's a lot of text in it. All of it simply illustration. There is no text whatsoever. And it is the story of, this is from the very, like very near the beginning of the book, where the man is, as you can see, I'm saying to the children, what is he doing? Well, he's obviously leaving home. I see the suitcase, the hands are, you know, supporting each other. She has made tea from, and is this Ireland? No, where is it then? And I ask the, the, those sorts of questions, then I say, they say, no, I don't think that is Ireland. Or maybe it's Ireland long ago, but no, if there's something about it's not Ireland. How do you know that? And none of these, this text tells you the answer to that. You infer, and you put all your evidence together to work out, well, this is far away. Eastern European is generally what we come up with. And this character is emigrating and he's emigrating to this weird, strange place where even the birds and the, the animals and the buildings look so unfamiliar. And it is an immigrant and we're seeing the new world from his point of view, from his eyes. It is a, it's a work of genius, the arrival. And especially I was using it at a time when we were having a lot of arrivals in Ireland from Europe and elsewhere. And there was this empathy that can be gained from just simply realizing, look, it's going to be so strange for people coming here. What does the world look like to them when they arrive in, say, Ireland? Or what was it like for our ancestors when they arrived in America? A very, very strange and different place. It's a very beautiful, very sad, but it was a happy ending. I'll be glad to tell you. Now, uh, just to round up with these, this is an, uh, a, a painting and it's called Nameless and Friendless. 
And I can do two one-hour lessons on this alone because I don't tell them the name of the painting or the painter, it's 1857. We need to know, we ask the questions, where is this? When was this painting done? Who are these people in this painting? How are they connected to each other? Um, what are the relationships? What are the feelings and emotions here? And then the big question, and how do you know all that? How do you know the answer to that? And it's all inferential. They do need knowledge of Victorian times because it's a Victorian painter. And of course, this, this um, Emily Osborne, her name was, she was painting at a time when, of course, ladies did not sell their art. And of course, at the beginning with the work on this painting, I wouldn't tell them that. We tried to work it out. What's wrong with her? Who is the boy? What is the link between them? And it would appear to me that she's trying to sell her work. Now, even not only children, but with teachers with that one, I get all sorts of possible ideas to what might be going on here. And um, I, I always feel there's really no answer that's right, as long as you can say, well, I think, and this is why I think that will, that will be fine. So, so what are they then? They are pictures and words and story, they are stories with pictures and words and stories with pictures and no words. I love the ones with no words because they do not distract us. With Rosie's Walk, this, the words are necessary, but the pictures are much more important. And in many of them, that is the case. They are, of course, works of art. Many of these writers are their own illustrator. Some of those are the best ones. And of course, they are always books that challenge the reader because in you can say, Duh, what's that about? You know, what's going on in this book? And as soon as I have covered, I've read a book and I'm coming to the end like that, and I'm asking myself that question, I know we have a challenging book here. This would be good for the children. And it's books which take risks because the reader, will the reader get it? Is what, <laughs> you know, the writer must be saying to himself. I'll just do it and I'll leave it up to the reader. And the reader may not get what I meant it to be, but the reader will get what he thinks he wants it to be. So it's, 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 it's all those, there are many books like, um, many writers of, of books for children, children's picture books, who are not this. They're not the kind of book I'm talking about. They have the story and they illustrate the story. That, and they're great fun, and they're great stories, but they're not these, these types of materials which are classic and which develop the thinking, the cognition of the, of the child or the young person. And they encourage reader high level questioning. That's it. What's it about? How do I know what that, that's, where's the evidence for that? And because of, you know, children who can read but who don't follow what they're reading with great levels of comprehension, these are a wonderful complement and addition to what you're, you're using to support their understanding of what they read. And of course, uh, we'd be very much into developing the, the thinking of children and these books develop thoughtfulness. So for example, with uh, Not Now Bernard, at the end, the big monster sitting up in Bernard's bed and his mom is still saying to him, oh, not now Bernard. She doesn't even recognize that he's a monster back in the house. And I say to the children, what will tomorrow be like? and you get the most wonderful oral storytelling, or they can draw the pictures for me of what it would be like in the morning when this monster wakens up again, and what will life be like. So very quick, nearly, nearly gone. So why read them? They're fun. They help reader and listener bond. Wonderful for parents, absolutely wonderful. Or for siblings to, to, to use with younger ones, or even just kids together. Visual literacy important for living in an increasingly visual world. And they see the detail, it's the detail that gives you a hint as to the meaning. The looking, appreciating and interpreting visual material are encouraged, brilliant. In urge to question the meaning, to read between the lines, to make inferences, and to look for what the writer does not tell us in actual words. That's what they are. They are an invaluable for a parent, for teachers, 
for anybody really, everybody should have them. And children should not be leaving school without being able to answer the question. And what was your favorite picture book of all time? What do you think is the, is the best picture book of all time? Just like, and who was William Shakespeare? It's exactly <laughs> the same thing, exactly. To examine demanding themes, you can talk about practically, and many of these do discuss very challenging things. For example, there's one of them called Duck Death um, and the Tulip. Duck Death and the Tulip is about death. Uh, and here it is, Duck Death and the Tulip. And Wolf Earlbrook. This is um, one I have not used with young or old children because it more or less say, look, death is there all the time. When Duck looks around, he says, death's behind him. And he says, look, you're always, why are you there? Every time I look around, you're there. And death says, yes, I'm, I'm always here. And he more or less, the story then more or less says, well, I'll be here, but you know, I'm not really harm. I, I don't mean, mean to be horrible. It's just part of your, your life, your experience, death. And I've just been a bit afraid of using that one, a bit too timid to use Duck Death and the Tulip, but you'll get wonderful books about war, world, the different, different wars, about conflict, about um, fears that children might have, about point of view, about adolescence initiating you into becoming a, 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 an older child or whatever. Unlike digital storytelling, illustration and picture books have a stillness and a reliability. They do not change at each viewing. In fact, more can be found each time you look. And many of these, I've had many of them for years and years since the children were small. And every time I look, every time I might share them with somebody or the group of children, I have to tell you, I find something else, something I hadn't actually thought of. And it's often the children who do that for you. The children find the things and think the things you didn't think. So we use them for oral language, they just talk, you just talk. Creative writing if you want to, reading and comprehension, especially inferential comprehension, drama, role play, improvisation, reader's theatre. Any teachers out there will know what reader's theatre is and all the things and wonderful things you can do with in drama. And then, of course, philosopher children, where in groups the children become a community of inquiry. And we use the picture books as the stimulation for the inquiry, and they come up with philosophical questions. And I said, and so on. Because you can do them for whatever you like, art, uh, appreciation of what you're looking at. So this, is, this was the cover of my thing. There's the arrival I mentioned. The tunnel is about a brother and sister growing up. He heads out without any care or thought of the dangers out there, and he doesn't come back. And she has to go down that tunnel to see if she can find him. And when she finds him, she goes through these horribly dark, dangerous woods. He's turned into a block of stone and her love saves him. It's a, just a delightful book. The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein is about the environment. Uh, it's always giving, we're always taking. The Wolves in the Walls is about our secret fears. The wee girl Lucy says, Mom, there's... There, there are wolves and there are noise in the wall, there are wolves in the wall, and they're going to come out. And mum says, no, it's all right, Lucy, they won't come out. They do. The wolves will come out and take over the house. And she has to defeat her, her fears at the end. Voices in the Park, a wonderful one of two points of view, from the point of view of one family, point of view of another family, um, for up the school, for secondary, Voices in the Park, a wonderfully dramatised one. And there's our my lovely not now Bernard. So um, coming to the end now, the, these that I've mentioned here, the, um, the boy, the mole, the fox and the horse. Oh yeah. This has been the book of the year and it's been in, this is, this is it here. It has been mm. on all the popular book lists. It's an absolutely delightful book with um, the pictures and drawings in it are very, very similar, almost pen. And the, the, the text is penned in, like as if somebody wrote it in. And it's about friendship and about fear and about love and so on. I, I, love, the, the, I love that book. But one that I have come across um, in the last week or so is Don't Cross the Line by Isabel Martins. And this is about a country where the general has said 
nobody is to cross that page. You are nobody is allowed to go onto the white page. You must all stay. Where did I get you one with a white page? You must all stay on one side of the line, and nobody is allowed onto that white page. And the soldier stands with his big gun and tries to keep everybody back. But of course, he doesn't succeed. And I thought, you know, this is very um, appropriate at a time when we are being told what to do. Now, I'm perfectly willing to do what I'm told because I see the reason for doing it. But I think a lot of people wonder, am I being told too much of the time what to do? I would think this would make a fantastic resource for talking about with children. And there are loads and loads of characters in it. You see all these characters on the, on the inside cover. They all appear at the end of the page and they want to get onto the other page. And they're all different people, you know, workers from the Simon and Lucas and there's Boo and there's the Bunny and there's a whole lot of characters there. See, at one level, I could use that with a, with a smaller child, but at another level, it's completely unsuitable. It's a much older child who would respond to that. Those are some of the best that I know of. Um, and I have got a list of all the picture books that I put into this category. If anybody wants to have a copy of that, I have a list of some for younger children, then a list for ones that are suitable for older. All of these guys here on this list should be familiar names in the mouths of children if they have been made literate and if they are properly educated. They are all classic writers um, of, of, of these kinds of books. And they write the most astonishingly complex books. They don't look as if they are, but they are. When asked, I'm nearly finished now. When asked in a recent interview mm -hmm. what books had influenced him growing up, Barack Obama said, Where the Wild Things Are by Morris Sendak. Now, I'd say any of you who had um, Where the Wild Things Are, I remember reading it to, to my kids when, when they were small. He mm -hmm. said it helped him work out who he was, where the wild things are. And it's gloriously, you know, illustrated. Morris Sendak, of course, is one of the most prolific and most challenging of writers and illustrators of these kinds of books. Barack Obama said it helped him work out who he was. Now, you just wonder what the thought processes that were what went on in that young boy's mind as he pursued an investigation of um, where the wild things are. Now, that's, 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 that's me for the moment. We can unmute you now for a second or two for our last few minutes. You can see that I quite clearly think picture books are a, a completely gloriously rich resource for people. But Flow Family Learning Organization, Liz Collette and I will offer 90 minute webinars via Zoom on aspects of, of literacy, numeracy and emotional development. And we will be doing that in January. So if you look out for our Facebook, Twitter and um, YouTube posts, there are our contact details. OK, so email and e uh, that email address will get any of the three of us. If anybody wants the list of um, picture books, you're very happy to have it. And if anybody wants to um, even have that PowerPoint, you'd be, I'd be more than delighted to give it to you. I'm going to stop share. We're all back together. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody want to ask anything or anybody have anything you want to say on, on that? I just, I just wrote in the chat there, Kate, that um, where the wild things are, I've, I've I actually, I don't, I'm not sure if I know that story, but I've seen it's been added recently, very recently to um, Netflix. I haven't watched it, but it could be a good follow-up for children that read the book and then Absolutely. like yeah. to watch it. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's as old yeah. as anything, Catherine, you know, I think it was written in the 1960s. I know, I, I've definitely yeah. seen it before, but I can't remember it myself. Yeah, 1963 was its first publication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's timeless, you know, they are all timeless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you often think looking at I remember when I first came across them with the children, I thought, God, I could write one of those. Yeah. I think I'll write one of those. No yeah. possibility of it. They mm -hmm. are just so clever and so profound. And in any case, there are some of them say they ended up doing their own illustrations 
because they could never find anybody good enough to do them for them. You know, they knew what way they wanted it to look, what the way they want to present mm. their characters and their settings and so on, you know? Mm. Yeah, it's a classic one. Could could I, Kate, have a list of those? Uh, if you'd email me the list, please. Oh, well, surely, Grace. Yeah, I'd really, yeah. Yeah, the list of them. And in fact, I, I have added that one there about the general not crossing the white line to it. But I know yes. I have a few others to add to it that I have come across and I want to make sure I've got them all on because there are some, there's, there's one here I want to mention to you. Um, and it's this one. This is not my hat by John Classen. Um, now that's around primary two, primary three type of book. You could read it with younger, of course, but I'm not too sure younger mm -hmm. would get it. And there we have the type of illustrations you have. Again, very, very little text, but the most intriguing pictures or drawings beside the text. And um, at the end of each of his books, something has happened. And you read it again and you look again and you read it, the whole book again, you think, is this really what happened? I can't believe it because it's quite, quite, it's almost like a massacre. It's almost like a, a crime has been committed at the end. And the wee ones I found, um, some of the wee Nuri kids I was using it with, were puzzled by it and weren't too sure. Some of them said, oh no, he got his hat back. And then others said, but I'm not sure what he did to get his hat back. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's very clever, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. It's once you've got these writers, they will always write in this intriguing way and therefore, you know, their books are worth getting. Yeah, I'll surely yeah. email you that, not a problem. I can email that surely, um, Grace, the list. Yeah, that's of that. great. Uh, have you been in the wee bookworm shop in Warren Point? It's a new bookshop. I haven't she been She seems there, to no. have very good books. Oh, it's books. brilliant, Kate. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. They're like hand selected almost. Yeah. And uh, the girls there, if you go in and you kind of describe the reader that you're looking for they can suggest appropriate things they're really mm. really lovely it's really nice I'll, but, I'll um, that. yeah lovely. um well i'm about to do storytelling with my um year nines in mm. school mm. and you were talking about doing that the um the theater reader and things like that um yeah. which would be the best book for that just to show them how you can sort of bring a book to life with your storytelling well, you see, anywhere where you've got more than one character in the book, yeah. you can do Reader's Theatre. And it, this is going to be much more challenging than if you've got a script with three characters in it. Mm -hmm. Because they, these characters do things in the books, but it doesn't tell you what they're doing. You yeah. know? Mm -hmm. Nor does it tell you what they're saying. So for a Reader's Theatre use of any one of these, you would be, you'd need to be pretty clever and you need to give them time in their groups to work out what you, how exactly will we interpret that bit of the story? You know, they're, they're, they're you know, they're, they're just, that just demonstrates to me how, how absolutely brilliant and challenging they are, you know? So this, for Reader's Theatre, it should be a book with no words in it and the kids have to put the words into the, into their mouths. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's sometimes, sometimes it is, yeah. There's, there's, there's that Rose Blanche, which is the, the one about the war. And the wee girl, the only colour is the wee girl in red. And there are very little text in it either. Wonderful, massive uh, illustrations of the war and the tanks and the, you know, mm. experience this child has of being in this situation. Um, that would make, you see, if, even if there is some text in any of these, they, they don't have to use that text. They are interpreting the, the meaning. Mm -hmm. by putting the illustration and the text together and make their own meaning. That's the beauty of it. And from, we kids are small, like primary two and primary three, they still think there are fairies out there. And I don't want them not to believe in fairies, but yeah. there is symbolism in all those stories for children. And they need to start now reading at a higher level and interpreting the symbolism of their traditional tales. So they get to a point when they are able to do it, but they won't do it if you don't make them, if you don't enable them to do that. You know, they'll still work at a very sort of, you know, literal level. Yeah. Yeah, so in any of those, um, there, there are so many to, to look through. I mean, the arrival, of course, the arrival. 
I mean, I know, all, I think all drama teachers know the arrival. And any Sean Tan, by the way, he's, he, he, he grew, grew up in Hong Kong. I think he lives in America now. Um, any, of, any of his books are absolutely intriguing. So also is Colin Thompson, of course, the Australian writer. You have to, I would put a module into teacher training and into child development programs on the use of these kinds of materials. Mm -hmm. Because I think mm -hmm. you need to know the books. You know, that's the important thing. Um, what's out there? What are the possibilities are there, are there out there with, with the books? And uh, honestly, a lot of parents and teachers too, I would say, are, know some of them. But I'm not too sure we all was aware of the possibilities, potential of them. <laughs> yes, thank you. That was yeah. really interesting. Okay, good. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, <laughs> it was, Kate. It gives us uh, to raise it from just reading it to question it more definitely. and getting them to look at, you know, definitely. And you have such a bonding yeah. with a child when you're doing that. Mm. You know, you're, you're developing yeah. them. You're definitely are developing. Yeah. 